last Sunday, uh, I, I woke up in the morning and immediately had this kind of apprehension in my gut about the content. Uh, and that just kind of lingered as I was getting ready to come in in the morning. And, and I suppose all of us in our work or even in school or sport, there's different reasons why you can have that kind of like, it's not quite what I wished it was kind of place, right? Like there's, the, there's sometimes things happen in your work week that are outside of your control and you just couldn't give your best energy and you show up kind of... Uh, happen to give less than your best effort. There, there's that kind of, it's not where I want it to be. There's also the, like, I wasn't disciplined and I was kind of distracted and I mostly was looking at my phone and there's that kind of, and then it catches up with you in the end. Uh, in, in my world, the, the other version is, uh, I don't really buy into this or I haven't been impacted by it personally and for better and for worse, I take a lot of pride in making sure that, I love Brian McLaren's statement of making sure that I'm not a, a, a what, what is it called, a, tour agent pointing to places that I myself have not visited. So what can get me in trouble is talking about something that I myself haven't been personally impacted by or care about, and that can lead to some really funky weekends. The danger there is self-absorption, but the other danger is I'm just bored with the material and therefore it's boring. And in the case of last Sunday, none of those three things were the case. Uh, I, I, frankly, I feel like I was pretty focused. I worked pretty hard. I really bought into the content. It was just one of those like, dang it, why can't I get it to where I want it to? And, and I was sitting there eating breakfast, and I was talking to myself about, because one of my new rules in this season that I'm in and what I've learned is I, I don't eat and look at my phone at the same time, even if eating is by myself and it takes me two minutes to eat my Greek yogurt. Like, I just don't do it. And as I was kind of in that space, thinking about the content, I, I was still aware of the tension and had a great conversation with the staff the Friday before about there's the type of solitude and silence that I think we know whether or not we practice, like we need time in the day and days in the week and, uh, you know, uh, days in the month and months, you know, there's, we need vacations, we need these big chunks of time to get away. And I think that's one form of solitude, but what was bugging me was that wasn't the kind I wanted to talk about. And there I was eating my breakfast and all of a sudden, this, this word interlude popped into my head. Now, I'm somewhat infamous for using words outside of what they actually mean. So at first, I was like, okay, well, I think that might be the word I'm looking for. It might be an aha, but I need to wait and look it up on Google. But first, got to finish eating breakfast because I don't look at my phone while I'm eating breakfast. And so eventually, I finished eating, and I grabbed my phone, and I looked up interlude, and I was like, that's it. That, that, that's the word. Because for me, it captured this reality that... There's the type of solitude that happens hours in the day, days in the week, that kind of thing. But then there's the type that happens like 30 seconds as you walk from one activity to another. Three minutes as you wait for a son or daughter to get out of practice. Four minutes as you get to the meeting before they do. We, we talked about this whole thing last week. And for me, the interlude kind of captured that. And at the risk of patting myself on the back, I guess the context I wanted to share there, because frankly, I got a lot of really good feedback. In fact, Tommy came up to me after the service, and he's like, because he, we, we talked about my struggle with the message, he's like, dude, that word interlude, like just play that chord more and more and more, like that, that's the idea. And again, at the risk of patting myself on the back, I guess I wanted to use that to reinforce that for me, there's, it just occurred to me this week, the irony there was the word interlude came while not filling the interlude uh, with entertainment or productivity. So if, if you've not been with us in this series, uh, we've been in this series called Save Me From My Cell Phone, and I sure hope that what you're taking is not that we're anti-technology, anti-phone, anti-productivity, anti-entertainment. Like that, that certainly isn't my heart. I know it's not the heart of the researchers, and it's really not the heart of most of the people I'm talking about, but rather, uh, we started the series by talking about the modern-day Marlboro Man, not, not to demonize Google or Apple or anybody else, but just to make the point that, that, that technology companies aren't going to create boundaries for us. That, that somehow we're going to have to, if we want to give it boundaries, and this, this isn't unique to technology, we're just in a very unique season, that if we want it to have boundaries, we're going to have to provide the boundaries because they're not going to do it. And that's really where that conversation started, is this hopefully provoking thought in you of what, what are healthy boundaries as it relates to your phone and Instagram and social media and being productive and uh, entertaining yourself. I mean, there's tension everywhere on this issue. And then last week, we talked about this idea of the interlude. And I think Scott Portinga and Missy as well, but if, if you were here when we brought Scott and Missy up, who were kind of the... the the godparents of this whole study, like they, they inspired me to jump into it and some of us to jump into it. But Scott talked about, he kind of pushed back on, you know, the question I asked Scott was, what are the hacks that you've put in place? And remember, he, he, if you were here, he really pushed back on that and said, no, wait, wait a minute. Like what the research says is you don't do hacks, you start at the beginning and you define what are your values? What do you want your life to be about? 
And therefore, how does technology complement those ends? And that, for me, was a really, really helpful reminder, probably where the series should have started. And it got me thinking about the interlude thing again, because even just this week, the language that I've been able to add to all of this is one of the things I've always really identified with within the kingdom of God and, and within Christian tradition is the contemplative tradition. Like those women and men who have just found value outside of this type of gathering, like not that they weren't a part of these types of gatherings, but finding value in, in those little moments and the opportunity for reflection, the opportunity for prayer, the opportunity for memorization. And I, part of what I've had to, it's really helped me put into words is uh, I, I have a very anxious mind. I, I've always had this tendency to have incredibly unhealthy um, obsessive thoughts. Worry has always been an issue. And I think one of the original attractants to Jesus for me was this tradition of you, you, don't, you don't push against that with substances, which frankly is what I did in my teens, but there's this other way of pushing against that by taking thoughts captive and, 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 and doing active things within that space. Uh, in fact, if you were with us at, at the beginning, I, I challenged you, and, and I don't know if you've been doing this or not, and it's okay if you haven't, but I think Paul in Philippians 4 captures beautifully the value of those interludes, and, and I actually challenged you to, to maybe memorize that. So what I wanted to do was shame you if you hadn't, um, and if you're working on it to read it, I'm kidding, I don't want to shame you, but I just thought it might be fun to, to reinforce that, to read this together. If you're memorizing it, maybe you can close your eyes. I'm kind of cheating because, so I got to warn you here that there's an amalgamation happening here because I memorized the first four, five, six, and seven, uh, the first four verses of the NIV, and then I switched to the NRSV over the first of the year, so the verse eight is in the NRSV, so it's all kinds of confusing, but here we go. Uh, so Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Are you with me? Uh, the Lord is near. You can pretend, even if you haven't memorized it. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And now this one's so difficult. Go ahead to that next slide. Finally, beloved, whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever's just, whatever's pure, whatever's pleasing, whatever's commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. I just wanted to do that as a review to go, this is where I hope that we've led you. It's, it's not that I'm anti my phone, I still have an iPhone. It's just building from the bottom up. And here's the question I want to ask this morning. We're going to kind of riff on this interlude idea for one more week <clears throat> before we transition into something else from this series next week. And I'm really excited to end on this point next week. But here's the question I want to ask this week is, is, is how does what we do with our interludes impact our social lives? I have a friend who for years and years and years said to me, uh, the quality of our lives is determined by the quality of our relationships. And I think the question that I want to ask this morning is, is what if the quality of our interludes dictates the quality of our relationships? Like in other words, what is what you do in those three minutes here and two minutes there and four minutes there and drives home and times where about 10 years ago you would have just been bored, what, what do those little moments and what is, how, how does what you do with those moments drive your experience of a social life. And, and really, I, I'm not going to pretend to have this giant thing. There's one bit of research that for me was pr pretty, I think it's the highlight of the book for me. It's definitely in the top five. Cal Newport in Digital Minimalism talks about this research that was conducted in St. Louis, haha, appropriately, at Washington University, a very prestigious research college I learned this week. And it was in the early days of neurobiology using PET scanners to just scan what's going on in the brain. And when they first started the research, having got their hands on this new equipment, the first thing they asked by watching brain imaging is they wanted to know, are there aspects of the brain, regions of the brain, that stay active across multiple different functions? And as they got into the research, it actually hit, it hit a, a thud pretty quickly because of what they quickly found was, actually, there's not. There, there aren't that many regions that, that light up that are consistently used over all these different activities. So then someone new came to the, to the research team, and, and they asked the opposite question. They asked, are there regions of your brain that are active when you're doing nothing? Now, I think they allow, like you allow, uh, doing nothing is a little oxymoronic when it comes to your brain, but all the same, like when you're not assigning your brain a cognitive task, when you're not assigning it something specifically to do, uh, I think of it as like the car's in park, the motor's on, 
but you're, you're bored, right? It's, it's, to me, it's the definition of the interlude. And the question that they began to ask was, what region of your brain is active, if any, during that part? And they actually identified a part. Uh, they, they began to call it the default region of the brain. And the default region of the brain, according to their research and, and, the, and the science that follows it, was that part of your brain that's fully engaged, those regions of your brain that are fully engaged when you're not assigning it a cognitive task. So then they kept going, and they built this long list of things that, that take the car out of park. Like when you do this activity, when you think about this thing, when you do this, the default region stops being the primary region. So then, of course, they started asking, okay, so when, when that part of your brain is working, what's it doing? And guess what they found? When you're bored, when you're waiting for someone to show up for lunch, and you're not staring at your phone, when you're walking home from work, and you have the ability to not even know what you're thinking about, guess what you think about? This is according to the research. Guess what you think about? Your social life. The relationship, the, the, the intrapersonal you, that relationship, others, both. Now, I, I just I, I kind of want to park on this for a minute because I think the implications of this, if accurate, are absolutely enormous. What the scientific research, like this isn't Jesus, this isn't like from Matthew 27, what these researchers have said from the 21st century is that when your brain, when your brain isn't given another task, it automatically defaults to thinking about people. Crazy, right? Because the first place my brain goes is, first of all, you ask, what are the implications of that? Well, if, if you're at all intrigued in Jesus or you follow Jesus, then you may be idea, aware of this idea that, that part of what Jesus really helps us put together about God, not everything, but part of what we can see clearly is that the way the theologians have said it for years is that God is a Trinitarian God. Now, what does that mean? Frankly, I'm suspicious of anybody who claims to have a robust understanding of what that means. It's very confusing. But there's aspects of it that we can glean. One of them shows up in John 17. And I think this gives us a glimpse. If you've never read uh, William Paul Young's The Shack, I highly recommend it. Some would throw it against the wall. I think it's a pretty honest attempt to make sense of what does this Trinity thing mean? Here's what Jesus prays for you and for I before his death. As you, Father, in me, are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Now, there's a lot of layers there. But here's part of what they say the Trinitarian God means, it is, is that God is in relationship with God's self. That God is at God's core, relational, even within the Trinity. And then you add the layer that God creates us in your image, creates you and I in his image, excuse me, and what does that tell us about you? that you are at your core a relational being. It reminds me a little bit of Jesus, the time when the people came up to him and were like, hey, don't have time for the long sermon. Give me the answer while standing on one foot, and I know you don't do yoga, so I don't think you can do it very long. And that isn't actually what they said, but that was the context. It was much like Andy Stanley's, if you're, if you're ready to deliver a message and you can't summarize it in one sentence, you're not ready. And you, you, you may remember, I think it's important to be reminded if you do, how Jesus answered. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Like a communicator, he cheats. He goes three sentences when he's given one. <laughs> and a second's like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Question. Back to the research. If this research is true, what, what's at stake as it relates to the way you use your interludes? Like, what, what, what's, if every time you have an interlude, you're productive, because again, I'm not saying it's never okay to be productive. If every time you have an interlude, you, you turn entertainment, what, what, like, what, what's the cost of that? What goes away? Or, or to put it in the positive, if you use your interludes in ways that are consistent with what it means to be human, what's the value of that time? What do you find yourself doing then? I heard a story this week of someone who... They, they used to listen to audiobooks while they were curling their hair, and she decided she was going to not do that and just stay silent in that time. And in that time, thought of a student and, and a situation and texted the student and had this really positive interaction. What is that? It's what the science would say happens in the interludes if, if we allow those to exist. Or, or we could ask it this way. When are you most likely to pray for someone? Like, when is someone most likely to come to mind and you go, boy, I wonder how they're doing with their, that funeral today? When are you most likely to go, man, we should have them over for dinner? 
We should go for a bike ride. We should hook up for a beer. When are you most likely to think about people, according to the research? It's in those moments of boredom. And so now let's flip it negatively. What's at stake? What happens if you're never bored? What happens if every time you have two minutes, and I think this is like the most ironic thing ever, if you're flipping through your Facebook feed or Snapchat or text or, or Instagram, again, no one's saying don't use them, but if every interlude is filled with that, what's the irony of that? It's, it's almost, to, to me, it's the equivalent of a Snickers bar versus a real meal. Like, we're, we're satiating ourselves. Like, socially, Instagram, Facebook, if we're not careful, it would seem that the research is saying, and if you want to dig into it deeper, I'd highly encourage you, as Hannah alluded to, grab Cal Newport's book. But what's the danger? Well, isn't the danger that your body really wants a glass of water, and so you just gave it a Pepsi, and there's nothing wrong with Pepsi necessarily, but you just teased yourself with what you really need, enough to what? Inoculate yourself from having what you really need. Do you, do you see, see the danger of all this? this? This for me was like the big pause in the book, and for me, the, the constraints I've put in place, it, this was really the why, and quite frankly, my experience of an enjoyment of relationship is at a level that I, I have not experienced since doing youth ministry, and I think I've identified the why. It's, it's because those moments where we crave this and we move towards meeting with people, it happens in these moments. It, it, it parallels some other research Cal Newport talks about, which involved a particular university, uh, that, that was among many, you've probably heard now, that universities, their, their mental health center of the school is a much more robust staff than it ever was 10 years ago. And Cal tells a story of a time where he was interacting with one particular leader of the staff at a large university, and she noted uh, that the influx of students was like nothing she had seen in, previously in her career. And she, she goes on to explain that <clears throat> prior to about 10 years ago, what, what students needed help with while they were away at college was homesickness, uh, eating disorders apparently manifest themselves real dominantly at that age. OCD manifests itself <clears throat> at, at that age. And then, of course, there's, <clears throat> excuse me, there's trauma. Like there's, but what they're beginning to note, and you can jump online and Google this, there's, there's stuff about this all over the place, was that there's this influx of anxiety in ways that hadn't been seen 10 years prior. And so there's research and there's conversation and this is where you can dig in as deep as you want. You can use the, the, the what is it, Google Scholar if you'd like. But what they're beginning to speculate, and there's some research to support this idea, is that part of what's in play is, is that we're, we, and, and again, I think if we're being fair, students are just a reflection of the culture, so we've got to be careful not to point fingers. We're, we're so busy filling our interludes with, with Snickers bars, with, with pseudo-relationship, that when life gets real, we lack adequate relationship to reach out to, which might speak to why therapists are, are at this all-time high. And listen, no one's say, I'm certainly not saying therapists don't have value, but it's because we lack relationships of that kind of depth. And furthermore, what the research is beginning to suggest, and this is terrifying to me, is that we're so incapable of talking to ourselves we talked in an earlier series on that death by self-talk, the difference between talking to yourself versus listening to yourself, that, that we're so lacking the skills to walk ourselves through difficult circumstances. Why? Because we can numb. That when we're faced with real situations that require real mental toughness, we don't have the skills. And therefore we're exposed and therefore we find ourselves in this crisis mode. All speaks to What? What we do with the interludes. I, then, ironically, I was having breakfast on Wednesday. It's kind of weird. And, and I couldn't help but think of this particular text. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. This goes all the way back to Exodus 20. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son, or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien residents in your towns. Now, one thing we know about this text is it was some form of tradition leading up to Israel being destroyed and led into exile and losing their temple and losing their sense of identity. But one thing it's certainly clear among the scholarship is the version that we're reading, its final form was written by a people who were carried off to a foreign land, lacked all the structure of their religious system and really had to bear down and get tough if they were gonna hang on to it. We're gonna explore this in, in May and June. What does it tell us that these people and the God that they serve 
had this understanding of like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If we're going to do this us and God thing, if we're going to do this relationship thing, God and people, God and one another, if we're going to be the, the kingdom on earth, if this community is going to reflect what I have in mind for it, it's as if God goes, okay, we're going to have to come up with a plan. Oh, I know what we can do. Let's give them a day where they're bored, where they can't check their Facebook feeds, where they can't answer emails, where they can't be productive, where they can't grow the business. Let's give them a day where they either like twiddle their thumbs Oh, no, let's make that the goal, twiddling of the thumbs. What does that tell us about the way we're wired as humans? And and to me, how does that validate the the scriptures and the way they parallel what science is telling us years later? Or again, look at it in the negative. Moses comes back from from this moment with God at the bush, which he may not have had with with an iPhone, I think, and then he comes back and he starts talking to the Israelite people, freedom, 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 and Pharaoh gets all threatened by that. Of course he does. They're a slave force. And what does Pharaoh, how does Pharaoh originally decide that he's going to resist giving them their freedom? Give them more work, he says. Let's not give them straw anymore. They got to come up with their own straw. What are the implications? If we just keep them busy enough, what will they not have time to think about? their relationship with God, with one another. Listen, I I have great respect for so many of you in the room who, quite frankly, are a part of this place consistently on Sundays. And I I think in an age when once a month is the new every week and the last thing I want to do is shame anyone over that, but, but what is the human design? If not this, then something. Something where we're we're left with ourselves. So I guess what I wanted to, and we're going to, again, transition out of the interludes next week, but to me, it's worth thinking about this overall tension of if life is really about God and people, what's the strategy for accomplishing that if all the interludes are filled? When the research says that's when your brain goes there. So here, here, what I want to do is, is a little bit seminary, but out of respect to you and, and this process, I thought what we should do is let's just kind of, I want to summarize the way Cal Newport kind of on the, like the practical how-to level, how he lands this. Because I think there's a, there's a building thing that we can do in five minutes that for me has proven tremendously helpful. So the first thing is this, quality versus quantity. I really think that part of what you have to navigate, because again, no one's saying don't look at Facebook, is quality of relationships versus quantity. I think you and I, we, we both know that, that social media and email and texting, it gives you, us the ability to have more connections than probably any people in the history of the planet. Like You, 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 can, you can stay connected with hundreds. I mean, if, if I had 1% as many friends as I do on Facebook, I would actually have friends, right? I mean, there's this, there's this huge quantity. To me, what the research is challenging is be careful to weigh the tension between quantity and quality. Because what Newport is saying and what the research is saying is, is quantity comes at, an, it comes at a cost. Every text you send is a text you have to reply to. Every post you make is a post you have to manage. And that ultimately takes away from time where you might actually pick up the phone and ask someone to go grab a coffee. So here's, I'm going to break it down into four things. Cal Newport would say this, prioritize conversation over connection. Connection he's using as a loose word, Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, that he's calling those connections versus conversations. What he's saying is we, we've got to turn it back to more conversations. And in fact, here's, here's a quote directly from his book, which is a little ominous. He says, if you adopt this philosophy, you'll almost certainly reduce the number of people with whom you have active relationships. So again, he's, he's saying there's a cost. Quantity versus quality, there, there's a tension there. Which leads to the second thing, and Scott talked about this, that the value of using technology, go to that next one, using technology to set up face-to-face interaction. That, that, and if you're going to get pushed by Cal Newport, here's how he's going to push you. Don't allow a relationship to just exist in the connection space. That the cost of too many relationships that are purely snap relationships, purely text relationships, pure Facebook relationships, is that ultimately that's robbing energy from relationships that you would pour into that involve real face-to-face people. I'm not suggesting it's easy, just kind of want to get that out there. It's on the mind map if you want to dig into this deeper. Third thing is this, prioritize phone calls over text, snaps, and etc. This one's been extremely difficult for me, but quite frankly, transforming. What he's saying is if you got 40 emails 
And, and I understand that in some of your work sectors and stuff, I mean, this all has to be applied differently. But ultimately what he's saying from a personal relationship, social life aspect is if you've got 10 texts to reply to and one phone call to make, make the phone call. That, that I think we all came to love texting because it rescued us from phone calls. What he's saying now is, and what's happened is, is we've so drifted from conversation with one another that we just have these superficial connections and so value phone calls. I, for years, ha- have followed this rule of I answer emails at certain scheduled times in my day. <clears throat> and here, here's where this has messed with me. I'm less efficient with emails than I've ever been. Because what he's saying is if you've got an hour set aside to answer emails and you look and you've got 40 emails and eight text messages and you've missed one phone call, make the phone call. <clears throat> Prioritize the phone call and ultimately what he's saying is reinforce to your community, that's the thing. So fourth leads to this. Uh, he actually talks about uh, keep phone call office hours. And, and I've started to do this with some of my friends, but what he's saying is uh, let your friends, let your kids, let people who might want to, who might otherwise text you during the day. And again, he, he, no one's saying texting's not okay, but what he's saying is let them know, hey, if you call me from 5 to 6, I'm driving home. If you call me from 11 to 12, I always leave that time open. That's when I answer emails. If you call me in this chunk of time, I'll answer. Like, and, and in fact, I'll stop whatever other thing I'm doing and I'll answer your phone call. That, he, he uses the, the college professor and this idea of reinforce to your friends and family that this is when you'll answer your phone. And again, no one's saying that you won't answer your text. You're just saying you're not going to give it immediate priority. So what you're reinforcing is if you really have to get me, you got to call me. And I think the last one is this, and I'm going to give this to you as a question because this one's not easy. I think we got to ask the question, what are you going to do Uh, with notifications. Now, I'll just tell you what I've done. It's not important to me that we agree on this. It's just important to me that that you've went through a process of thinking about it. I don't have any notifications on my phone on. If you text me, this includes my wife, my kids. If you email me, if you snap me, my phone's not going to go off and tell me that happened because... I don't have enough discipline to ignore the sound or to pick up my phone when I want to like answer, do something on Evernote or, or I want to do something intentional and see four banners. I don't have the discipline to not be distracted by those. So I don't, I don't get any notifications, audible or banners, which means that when I open my phone, I don't have the red number on my text, which doesn't mean I won't text you back. It just means I'm not going to text you back with any kind of urgency. It, I'm going I'm to reply to text the way I reply to email. So I'm assuming if you send me a text, it, it's not a like urgent thing. It's a, you know when you get a second, just like an email. But if you call me, I'm answering. And if I can't, I'm calling you back. So the question becomes, what are you going to do with notifications? And again, here's the bottom line. What if the value of your interludes drives the value of your relationships? And what if technology is designed that what they've recognized is that the market available are your interludes? And so therefore, what if Part of what it means to be human, part of what it means to be a Christ follower who's given their life to loving God and loving people is quite frankly, we've, we've got to establish our own boundaries for it because it never will for us. Listen, I, I know in some sense this might feel like the most non-God, non-church thing ever, but here's my challenge to you. If following Jesus involves a creed of God and people, then I hope, if nothing else, what you're hearing me say is that it becomes imperative, according to the research, that we understand that interludes are not these unproductive, purposeless times. They're actually at the very core of what allows a person to have healthy connection with God and others. I'd like to pray, and we'll we'll sing our way out of here. God, Lord, pretty... um, I don't know, maybe a little black and white this morning. Uh, But at the same time, God, my my prayer is that that the older we get and the more that we mature, uh, the more you would raise the bar on what it takes for us to experience joy. And that, God, that that in a culture that more and more uh, has commodified joy, that we would find it in relationship, in being together and sharing experiences with one another. And so, God, my prayer is that whether it's high school students or middle school students or empty nesters, 
right? whether it's young parents or really busy professionals with really invasive technology in their life, that you would, that you would spark in us uh, important conversation about where, where we're going to create the boundaries to make sure that we don't spend our life satiating real hunger with, with Snickers bars. God, that we would have the kind of relational portfolio that honors you in both the support that we lend and that that we can receive. We love you, God. Amen. If you would like to learn more about Narrate Church, find us at narratechurch.org or look us up on Facebook and Instagram.